application. I don't know why you would do this, but if you were scaling it down, right? In this region, what you would hear is all of your sound, right, would kind of like get out of phase. Like the higher stuff would get like a little like left a little behind, whereas the low stuff would stay in tune. So your audio signal would just sound weird. Um, and what I'm going to do, hopefully on Wednesday, is I'm going to bring in, I'm going to like try, if I can get sound figured out, I want to show you like kind of like what these distortions can sound like. Um, but yeah, so that's what the uh, phase plot gives you. We'll talk about this a lot more. Okay, so I just want to kind of like finish like kind of high level on this. Um, so almost always, right, our signal is going to consist of a bunch of different frequencies. We're not just going to have like one frequency. You're going to have like my voice, right? There's some filtering going on here with this thing. Um, and so what we want to do is kind of think about it as like, you know, there's a bunch of different frequencies all happening at once. Um, and as you know, right, based on the example we did with two sources, you could still kind of apply the same basic idea of impedances and frequency response and so forth. You have many frequencies at once. You just do superposition. So for example, like if you push a one on a phone, you get a sound, which is really just two signs added together. Uh, antennas, as I mentioned, they should theoretically pick up all frequencies of all transmissions in the universe. Um, and what's kind of neat is, and this is really EE20 stuff, but you know, we're going to talk about it a little, is if you're given a signal in time, you can convert it into like a, a frequency domain representation. So what I mean by that is there's a math technique where you can take something. Like here I have sine 3000t, and I could do something to it, some kind of math thing where I'll end up with a plot here that says I have a frequency of 3 thousand and very little of anything else, right? And if that was a perfect sine wave, there should be an impulse function at that. Um, so this is beyond our class how to actually do this. But I think conceptually it's really useful to think about how filters work, right? Like a 3,000 hertz thing, there's only one thing happening if you'd like. Like if you wanted to do a phaser problem, you would just need one source to, like, to, to peg what it does. Uh, for example, though, you might have like here, here is a in time, right? Even just having two signs at one time look kind of ugly, right? This is, uh, two, this is when you push one on a phone. If you were to go and look at it on the scope in the lab, over time it would look like that. If you Fourier, Fourier transformed it, you'd get two peaks, one at each of the actual uh, frequencies gen like behind the scenes there, which are 697, 1,209. So what's cool about filtering, right, is if we take a filter, for example, this one right here, and the cutoff frequency is around 1,000, and it's really steep, right? So as soon as I go like a little over, we're dropping like 10 orders of magnitude. Um, what we'll see here, is, and actually it's 7, right? So it's a 7th order filter because he's dropping off at, uh, the, the power of 7 of the frequency. But right here, right, uh, if you take that filter on the left, you have a circuit that does that, and you apply these two sources, like a phaser problem like you've been doing, and you plug them in and you use them as the two sources, what you'll find is that this one right here will just get like annihilated and made very small, whereas this one will stay. And so this is like a really fundamental and very cool idea in like 30 seconds, <laughs> and we'll talk about it a lot more, but this is kind of like why filtering is neat. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'll just mention for Wednesday, just to draw the distinction so you've heard of it, so there's passive filters, the one we did in class, right, with the resistor, like the ones we've been talking about so far, they're just resistors, capacitors, and inductors, so they're passive, they don't have any sources, they're nice because they don't need any power, and they can you know, handle big voltages because there's nothing to worry about saturating, and they're cheap. Uh, the other kind of filter, which you'll build on Wednesday, is an active filter, which is basically just the same kind of thing, but with op amp. So we'll have, you'll have plenty of those in your homework. And the thing about active filters is that you can get more complex answers, so the homework will be harder. But they're really nice, right? So the other nice thing about them is they give you this independence of load. OK, so that's active filtering and passive filtering. I'll be in 240 in a little while. If anybody wants to talk homework, 